after a few of the other speakers, and I would like to now introduce our next speaker. Make sure I've got this. Our next speaker is Dr. Larry Golby, and I've known Larry for about eight years now. Larry's been a chairman of our scientific advisory board. He's been a member of uh, Cure PSP uh, actively since its formation in 1990. He serves as our director of research and clinical affairs, and he is the premier expert when it comes to, to PSP and CBD and related disorders. Uh, Larry received his medical training at New York uh, University School of Medicine and training in internal medicine at Hanahan, Hanuman University and in neurology at NYU Bellevue Medical Center. He joined the faculty at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, UMDNJ, uh, in 1983, advancing to professor in, in 1997. His principal research interests are PSP and genetics and epidemiology of Parkinson's disease. Dr. Golby performed the first study of the prevalence and risk factors in PSP and has chaired uh, Cure PSP Scientific Advisory Board since 1992. He has been named by Castle Connolly and New York Magazine as top doctor for the past several years and received the American Parkinson's Disease Association's Fred Springer Award in 2003 in recognition of his research and accomplishments. Dr. Golby. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all for coming. Um, first of all, just because there's a, um, a carry-all on a seat does not mean that it's occupied. Every seat received a carry-all. So I will invite people who may be sitting over there or maybe in the back to come sit in this first row here where there are plenty of empty seats. The screen is a little small and I put in a lot of work on my slides and I want you all be, to be able to see them. So uh, don't be afraid to just come in here and occupy these close-in seats. I'm, uh, I may have prepared a few too many slides, so without further ado, I'm gonna get started. Richard introduced me and my activities very generously, thank you. The causes and cures of PSP. We don't have a cure yet, not that we know of, uh, but we're, uh, we're getting closer. Uh, the causes, we don't know that yet either, but we're getting closer on that. And Richard did a nice job of summarizing our, uh, the genetics, and I'll talk about that in some more detail. First of all, uh, it's um, considered kosher to uh, disclose any potential conflicts of interest, uh, including discussion of off-label drugs. All the drugs I will discuss will be off-label because there is no approved drug for PSP yet. Hopefully that'll change soon. Uh, my uh, medical school, which is around you right here, receives um, funds from those two drug companies for my work in testing their drugs. Uh, my medical school also receives uh, grants from those three organizations for my research, and I work as a consultant for that drug company. So PSP, the, the man who, who named PSP is a good friend of mine. His name's John Steele. He was a resident at the time, 1963, and he says that he, the, the biggest regret of his life is choosing this name for this disease because it's just so unwieldy and it's not all that accurate as a descriptor. Uh, there is progression. So that part is accurate, but there's no point in rubbing people's noses in it. Uh, supranuclear refers to the fact that the eye movement problems of PSP are not primarily in the clusters of brain cells down in the brain stem that control the eye movements, which are called the nuclei, but rather they're at some higher clusters of brain cells which control those nuclei in the brain stem, and so it's called supranuclear. Terribly technical term. 
And palsy, contrary to popular belief, does not mean shaking, but it means weakness. And in this case, it refers to the movement of the eyes. The actual limbs are not weak in PSP, but they have a hard time coordinating. Probably the most famous person who's ever had PSP was the actor and musician Dudley Moore. He illustrates the common problem of excessive contraction of the muscles of the face. You can compare him to when he was younger and healthy. It, and uh, it, it looks like the person has just kind of experienced something frightening or smelled something bad because of the contraction of the facial muscles. There are some of my patients, not as famous as Dudley Moore, but they show the same kind of facial appearance. So the main features of PSP, now I'm, my lecture is on the causes and cures of PSP, so I'm not going to provide a detailed description of what the disease does or what the symptoms are or the natural history uh, or how you diagnose it. I'm going to try to confine this to causes and cures, but just for the sake of orienting everybody, and probably this audience, less than any audience, needs a catalog of the symptoms that PSP produces. The balance is a major issue. Speech, swallowing, slowed movement, slowed thought, insufficient movement, not just slow, but not enough of it. Problem moving the eyes, a behavioral change that's called frontal, because that's the main part of the brain that is the problem, and impaired function of the bladder. The balance problem is the first symptom in over half of patients, 60% or, or even more start out with just falls. And this may uh, produce a, a referral to a, an ear specialist to see if maybe it's an inner ear problem or maybe to a, a, a neurologist to, uh, or a cardiologist to see if maybe there was a, a fainting spell or a neurologist to see if there was a mini stroke or something like that. And very often these, uh, the patients will see half a dozen doctors before they find one who diagnoses PSP. The gait is very irregular. It looks like a drunken walk. Person seems unconcerned, like someone who's drunk. They, unlike somebody, say, with Parkinson's disease or someone who's had a stroke, someone with PSP often just doesn't pay attention to how bad their balance is, and that makes the balance problem all the more dangerous. And this is a major cause of complications, as you might imagine. A hip fracture really uh, will change the whole course of the disease. The um, this insufficient movement is called bradykinesia. That's Greek for slow movement. It resembles a Parkinson's disease. Some of it is actually muscle stiffness. This occurs particularly in the face and neck, the upper back, and it makes it hard to compensate for the balance problem. So that when you, uh, if you're center of gravity does get thrown off in one direction, it makes it hard to compensate for it by moving your legs. The speech problem produces this ataxic dysarthria. There's a, these irregular bursts, kind of an explosive quality. There's also a strained quality, which makes it sound like there's rubber bands in the throat. Not everybody has all these symptoms, of course. And there's low volume, which it has in common with Parkinson's disease. PSP usually has two of these three things. There's also very often a constant kind of growling. This is part of the general disinhibited behavior uh, coupled with a, um, a difficulty in stopping off the flow of air in the throat voluntarily. The swallowing problem is the main source of complications, even more than falls. It can allow thin liquids to leak down into the windpipe. And that after that happens repeatedly, it can cause pneumonia, just because the liquid irritates the lungs eventually. And an irritated lung can't fight off whatever bacteria come down there in the normal air and allows uh, pneumonia to develop. A large piece of food in the windpipe is a much less common complication, but still it's something that you have to watch out for. Now, the frontal lobes of the brain. When you lose function in the frontal lobes, it causes problems with attention, initiative, ability to abstract ideas, ability to inhibit inappropriate actions, 
and it, it affects the ability to organize the thought and to speak quickly, as quickly as you would like. The things that are not very affected in PSP are the memory, language, and spatial orientation. These are the things that are very severely affected in Alzheimer's disease. So in this very important sense, the mental problem of PSP is the opposite of that in Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, you have problems with memory, language, and spatial orientation, and not so much in these, although there is a, a variant of Alzheimer's that does include those frontal things. Okay, so now let's get down to some uh, science class here. What is going on in the brain? You heard Richard refer to the tau protein. Well, here's what the tau protein is supposed to be doing. Uh, this doesn't show up so well, but that's a normal brain cell right there. You have all these little uh, branches coming out that connect it with other brain cells. And each of those branches has a long uh, arm, long tube, that's called an axon or a dendrite. And inside each of those are these kind of, kind of like bones, you can think of them, except instead of our arm having two bones or one bone, there's several dozen of them in here. And each of the microtubules functions not only for mechanical support, but also as kind of a monorail along which chemicals get transported, including the vesicles that Richard mentioned. The vesicles are those little water balloons filled with critical chemicals that the cell needs. The chemicals are made in the center of the cell where the DNA is, because the DNA is necessary for a specification of the instructions. And the vesicles get transported along the microtubules out to the very end where the other business goes on, including communication with other brain cells. So that happens along this microtubule. Now, what is the microtubule made of? Well, it's made of uh, these proteins arranged in kind of a spiral pattern. And the, the main protein that's made, that goes into the microtubules is not a problem in PSP. We don't know of any defect in that. However, there's this tau protein which forms a kind of supporting structure, kind of like a little scaffold around the, mic the microtubule. And that's the problem with PSP is in the tau. So we don't know which is chicken and which is egg, but the tau protein forms these clumps. It, it clumps up together, forms these things called neurofibrillary tangles, and the microtubules fall apart as a result. And maybe not as a result. Maybe the microtubules fall apart for some other reason, and that frees up the tau which then forms aggregates. As I say, we don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg. And here's a picture, an actual photograph, uh, through an electron microscope. These black, uh, this is through the electron microscope, and this is through a regular microscope, showing uh, these uh, black clumps are the tau. Of course, you have to stain them with a special stain to make them show up black. And this is through an electron microscope, uh, those are the tangles. Now, why might the microtubule fall apart? Why might the tau not do what it's supposed to do? Why might the tau be sticking to itself and forming these tangles? Well, one possibility is that there's a genetic defect in the tau. And years ago, this was searched for back uh, really 15 years ago that search began, and it came up with a, uh, with a genuine, with a winner here, a, this tau defect called the H1 haplotype. Nevertheless, it remains true that PSP is only very weakly hereditary. Only about one out of 100 people with PSP has someone else in their family with PSP. Whereas for Parkinson's disease, the figure is about 20 or 25 people with, uh, 20 or 25 percent of people with Parkinson's have a close relative also with Parkinson's. For PSP, it's 1 percent. But maybe you can find more subtle expressions of PSP in the family if you look carefully enough. I'll get to that in a minute. 
So that H1 haplotype, what does that mean? Well, I'm not going to get into the molecular biology too much, but I'll just tell you that the H1 haplotype is where there's a reversal of order of, uh, in the chromosome of a certain stretch of genes. This is the H1, and the, um, the order of reading is it's as if you're reading a book and you're reading from left to right, and suddenly there's a, a, little, a few words in the middle of the line that go from right to left. And then when those are finished, it resumes left to right. That's what's going on in this H1 type of tau. The H2, it just reads straight through left to right the whole way. Now the H1 is the more common kind in the population. As you see here, each person has two chromosomes, of, uh, two of each uh, number chromosome. So if chromosome 17 is where the tau gene is out of our 23 pairs of chromosomes. On chromosome 17, 94% uh, of chromosomes in people with PSP have the H1, but in controls, in other words, the rest of the population, it's 77%. I know this doesn't seem like that big a difference, but believe me, in genetics, this is a big deal. This is a very big difference for a gene. Corticobasal degeneration, a disease very similar to PSP and one which is in Cure PSP's research portfolio. Uh, it's almost as marked, almost as uh, much of a difference between CBD and controls as there is between PSP and controls. Now, if you look at individual people rather than chromosomes, it's, a, it's also a big difference. People who get an H1 from each of their parents 88% get H1 from each of their parents, while for controls, it's only 60%. So we can say that the H1H1 genotype, in other words, people who got an H1 from each parent, is nearly necessary, but far from sufficient for PSP to develop. One, having one chromosome 17 with the H2 haplotype reduces PSP risk. And if you have both chromosome 17s with the H2 haplotype, it reduces the PSP risk more. So it would be nice to know exactly what that reversal of that segment of chromosome 17 is doing to reduce or increase PSP risk. Now, what conditions the genetic effect? In other words, what other things are there that affect the expression of that problem caused by the gene. And that's what, the, uh, that's what all the epidemiology and the risk factors and the current genetic whole genome analysis are aimed at. First, let's go back, as promised, and talk about uh, in the families of people with PSP, what is the chance of finding some relative either with a little dementia or a little Parkinsonism? Well, the chance, if you have PSP, the chance of finding one of those in a close relative is about 32%. And in families of control individuals, it's 22%. That's not quite statistically significant. It would have to be less than 0.05, but still, it's intriguing. For corticobasal degeneration, it's a similar difference. Now, that's just one study. Here's another study. Again, this showed a suggestion, but not a statistically significant difference in the incidence of Parkinsonism or dementia among the parents and siblings of patients with PSP and of controls. This shows not the number that had the Parkinsonism or dementia at that time that the research was done, but rather uh, over what age they developed it, much more sensitive way of doing it. So those two were negative, but there's a third study that is positive. In this one, 
They took first degree relatives of people with PSP, that means parents, siblings, and children, and first degree, and they, and first degree relatives of controls, and they actually gave them an exam. They gave them a test of reaction time, and they also gave them a test of ability to smell, which is reduced in PSP somewhat, and also gave them a test of mood, that's affective tests. So a test of reaction time, ability to smell, and an assessment of their depression. And they found that there was a difference between the relatives of people with PSP and the controls. So there's something subtle going on among relatives of PSP, at least according to one of these three studies. Now you may ask, okay, well, how can a genetic disease not clearly run in families? Why is it that you have to look at 100 people with PSP before finding one that has a relative with PSP if there's a big genetic component? That's because genetics does not equal heredity. There may be reasons, some explanations. Maybe multiple genes are necessary. In other words, you have to have the abnormal version of more than one gene in the same person at the same time to get the disease. There might be recessive inheritance where you have to inherit the abnormal version from each parent in order to get the disease. So that may conceal the disease in your family members. You may have to not only have the genetic defect, but also some kind of environmental influence, like some trauma or some dietary practice. And it would be unusual for one person to have both the genetic defect and the necessary trauma or dietary practice. Maybe the, it's called the penetrance, maybe the uh, appearance of PSP is masked in many of your relatives just by the fact that they didn't live long enough to develop it. The average age for PSP to start is 63, but a lot of people develop it a lot older than that. Maybe non-paternity is an issue. No one likes to think about this, but actually one out of 100 people in the general population, their father is not the person that their mother says is their father. And so that will obscure family history. Actually, the, the common figure that doctors and anybody else uses for this is 10%. It turns out that's, that's bogus. It's really 1% when it's studied carefully. But 1% is still impressive. And finally, stochastic factors. There's a word that a lot of you have probably never heard before, stochastic. What does that mean? It means, well, it means random, really. Um, these, uh, the tau protein is a good example of how stochastics might contribute to the cause of PSP. The tau protein does not, if it's just floating around in the fluid in the cell, it doesn't have a particular shape, but if it's uh, stimulated with enough outside influences, it can form a particular rigid shape and it can induce other tau molecules nearby to do the same thing. And it's kind of a matter of chance. It's kind of a matter of bumping into something just by chance. And once that happens once in a cell, it can snowball. It can be like a chain reaction. And the tau clumps can build on themselves just from the initial one chance event, which is, has a certain low probability of occurring. So that's what I mean by a stochastic factor. So maybe you have to not only have a gene or two or three that's in a variant form, plus some kind of external influence like trauma or a toxin exposure, but you might also just have to be unlucky enough to have a tau molecule bump into the wrong other molecule at just the right time and start clumping up with itself. So on the theory that there's more than just the tau protein defect contributing to the cause of PSP, the, uh, our organization, Cure PSP, got together this genetics, simp genetics uh, consortium. And um, a lot of scientists around the world helped uh, put this together. I'm proud to be a member of the group right there. 
declaration of conflict of interest right here. Uh, the uh, overall organizer, as Richard sh said, was Jerry Schellenberg at the University of Pennsylvania. And this guy, Gunter Herglinger, who was a member of our scientific advisory board, he actually had the original idea for doing this. And um, although at a much smaller scale because the the amount of grant money we had available for regular grants, which only would have allowed it to be done on a much more modest scale. And when we received his grant application, the scientific board said, hey, you know, we really need to do this right. Can Cure PSP raise a million dollars to do it right instead of the $50,000 that Dr. Herglinger was applying for? And thanks to uh, the Peebler Foundation, and many other generous donors, we were able to raise a million dollars to get this job done, and thank you to them. So here's the results, and as Richard said, this is gonna be published in two weeks in this journal, Nature Genetics, which is the world's leading genetics journal. This is big stuff. It found in 1,100 PSP patients and 3,000 controls, it was two stages, one stage used just autopsy specimens so that we could be sure of the diagnosis. The other half used some autopsy and some specimens from living patients where you can't be 100% sure of the diagnosis. Anyway, they found these novel signals, it's called. In other words, some genes that are present in a different distribution of variants in the patients with PSP relative to the distribution of variants in the controls. The genes implicated encode proteins for vesicle membrane fusion, for uh, unfolded protein response, and for a myelin structural component. And Richard explained that in much simpler, clearer terms than this uh, technical abstract does. And I know you can't see this, but this is a table right from the article that will appear in the journal, and I think I'm gonna skip this. So there's gonna, the, the findings of this genetics project are now gonna open up a huge set of opportunities for researchers because now we have these pieces of cellular machinery that weren't previously suspected of being part of the PSP process. Well, we knew it had something to do with folded proteins, uh, but the vesicle thing and the myelin thing, those were previously unsuspected. So now scientists all over the world, as soon as this article appears in two weeks, there's gonna be an explosion of interest in PSP because now there are all these new scientific opportunities, these new questions that have arisen. And people who work on myelin, for example, in connection with multiple sclerosis are now gonna say, hey, you know, maybe my work in myelin, you know, it hasn't cured multiple sclerosis yet, but maybe we can figure out how it's applicable to PSP. And scientists who are working on vesicle function will say, hey, you know, maybe something in my work or the techniques I know can be applicable to PSP. That's why this genetics project is just gonna be a real springboard. In addition, the genetics project, I hasten to add, confirmed what we already knew about the tau gene, and it also implicated that there's something else going on with tau besides just that H1 haplotype where that section is reversed. There's another defect in tau, independent of the H1 haplotype that is doing something. We don't know what yet. And that's gonna be another interesting thing. There's already a huge industry of tau science going on that grew up not only in response to PSP, but also to work on Alzheimer's disease, which has tau tangles like PSP does. Now another part of the problem in PSP, and one which has been known for a long time, is the mitochondria. The mitochondria are these little factories inside all of our cells, all of our cells except for red blood cells. That's where our bodies make energy from allowing sugar to be burned in the presence of oxygen. It's not that simple. It's pretty complicated. If you, if you passed high school biology, you know how complicated this is. Uh, the mitochondria have their own set of genes that are kept apart from the cell's main set of genes, which are in the nucleus. The cell keeps its main set of genes in the nucleus, but the mitochondria have their own genes. That's because the mitochondria, way back in our evolutionary ancestors, when we were all little single bacteria swimming around 
in the ocean, um, one kind of bacteria which was able to make energy very efficiently but didn't have other types of machinery that would have been helpful, entered another kind of bacteria, it was probably eaten by them. The first kind, the, the predator bacterium did not have an efficient way of making energy. It relied on fermentation like yeast use. It's not as efficient an energy extractor as respiration. So now the predator had these little factories inside of it that could make energy more efficiently. And it just, it worked together with them. And every time the, the predator bacterium wanted to divide, it would, each of the daughter cells would take some of the mitochondria along with them. And the, they developed this symbiotic relationship. And that's all cells of plants, uh, all cells of animals have these mitochondria. And plants have something similar. That's not mitochondria, it's chloroplasts, and that's where photosynthesis takes place. So there might be something wrong with the mitochondria in PSP. Now the mitochondria don't have the sophisticated protective mechanisms that the rest of the cell does. They are very susceptible to toxins, and they're very susceptible to genetic mutation. The DNA in the mitochondria are not nearly as well protected against ultraviolet, for example, and against heat. So they mutate very easily. And in fact, there is a problem, a genetic problem, in the mitochondria in PSP. And this is what they look like. This is an electron micrograph. That's a mitochondrion. Here, first look at this one. Here's a brain cell. Here's the nucleus. And here, this little thing down there, hot dog shaped thing, is the mitochondrion. And here it is blown up, has all these little walls inside on which the reactions take place. And this is an electron microscope slice of it. All right, so let's move on to the environment. Um, there's been very little study of the environmental uh, exposures in people with PSP. Richard mentioned that I did the first one and it was a long time before another one was done. Uh, what I found, the only thing that came out of my study was that people with PSP tend to have a little bit less education. They're slightly less likely to have completed high school than people who don't have PSP. Now, what, how might this cause a disease like PSP? Well, people who don't complete high school are a little more likely to, say, work in a factory where there might be exposure to toxins, while people who complete high school are a little more likely to work in somewhere besides a factory where there might not be toxins. Or people who uh, are less wealthy may live in a part of town where there's more toxins in the environment. Uh, I mean, you can, um, you can quote sociological studies till the cow comes home and think of all sorts of theoretical explanations for this. And this was confirmed in France by this researcher, found the same thing. So what might it be? More occupational exposure, residential exposure. Poor people and rich people tend to have dietary differences. Or it may be synaptic reserve. This is a very interesting hypothesis. Uh, we scientists think that when you get an education, spend a lot of time reading and thinking and discussing, that you develop more connections between your brain cells to allow more complicated functioning of the brain. And then if later in life, decades later, if some disease comes along that destroys those connections, you, you don't see the effect as much if you start out with more connections. And it's educated people who have more connections. So um, that may be why uh, PSP seems to be more common in people with less education. Only a theory. Another clue to an external environmental cause of PSP arises from these two, whoops, these two islands, Guadeloupe in the Caribbean and Guam in the Pacific. Uh, first, I'll say, say a little bit about Guam and then, and then leave it alone. There's a, an ethnic group on Guam called the Chamorros that developed this PSP-like illness. Uh, but under the microscope, it's not all that similar to PSP. Uh, 
a dietary theory has been examined but is now being discounted. A genetic theory was originally considered to be most likely because it's just one ethnic group and then it was discarded but now it's being re-examined with the more sophisticated genetic technology that we have available. So the, uh, we still really have very little clue about the Guamanian disease. On Guadeloupe, not that we have any more idea of what's causing that, but there's a very compelling finding. These two fruits called sweet sop and sour sop are more commonly consumed by the people on Guadeloupe who have PSP than by the people who don't have PSP. Here's what it looks like. This is uh, sour sop and this is sweet sop. They're consumed as a milkshake type thing or as ice cream. In fact, if you go to a Caribbean restaurant in New Brunswick, New Jersey, you can find this. Here's Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. Beautiful place. But in the sweet sop and sour sop, there is a brain toxin called anonacin. And anonacin damages, guess what, the mitochondria. And if you inject anonacin into rats, you can produce tangles of tau in their brain. Pretty good clue. So that is a work in progress. And this shows the likelihood that people on Guadeloupe who have PSP or some other atypical Parkinsonism are much more likely than people with regular Parkinson's disease to have consumed sweet sop or sour sop. That's an odds ratio there. And compared to controls, it's a similarly high number. Now we'll move on to treatment. And before we do that, it's halfway, I've got the timing down perfectly. It's time for everybody to do a little stretching. Because I see, as a neurologist, I see signs of somnolence in the room here. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're just going to take 30 seconds. I know not everyone in the room finds it easy to stand up. So we're going to do some stretching in situ. So do all that once a day and you'll keep your hamstrings nice and stretched to avoid And you'll also help avoid the frozen shoulder, which is very common in people with Parkinsonian disorders, where if you're just not using your shoulder joints very much, it tends to kind of get scarred down and inflamed. And a lot of people with PSP and Parkinson's have had operations on their shoulders to relieve what was diagnosed as rotator cuff syndrome, when actually it was just a frozen shoulder from not getting enough uh, stretching exercises. Okay, let's proceed. Treatment of PSP and CBD. First of all, Unfortunately, so far, we just have symptomatic treatment. The treatment we have does not 
slow down the underlying brain cell loss. All we have so far is stuff that may help the superficial symptoms, which is still good if you can do it. We are doing research on preventative treatment, also called prophylactic treatment. It would work best in the earliest stages of the disease, it would, and certainly it would work best before the symptoms of the disease even start. Maybe uh, people who are at risk of PSP, maybe because they have a relative with PSP, could be tested somehow, and if the test turns up positive, they could be put on some kind of a treatment that would prevent them from developing PSP. Of course, this treatment would have to be very inexpensive, very safe, and the test would have to be uh, would have to not have false positives. Okay, so um, early diagnostic markers, things that might work are genetic tests, maybe some imaging procedures, and maybe some kind of spinal fluid test. And all these things are being researched right now as pre-symptomatic markers for PSP. Keep in mind that even even if you start treating PSP at the earliest stages, you're not going to repair any damage that's already occurred. That's different. I mean, that's called restorative therapy, and that's even further in the future. I'm not saying it's never going to happen, but it's a whole different kettle of fish, technically, than preventative treatment. You would have to reestablish some very complicated connections with neighboring brain cells, and we don't have the technology to do that yet. Now, the medications for the symptoms of PSP, the main one is levodopa carbidopa, uh, which is the main, main uh, drug for Parkinson's disease. It helps PSP a little bit uh, in many cases, but not for as many years as it helps Parkinson's. Amantadine, which is another Parkinson medication, can help also for only briefly and not dramatically, but still to a useful degree in many people. Antidepressants can help the depression and can sometimes help the balance. Uh, sedatives can help the sleep problems. Bladder medications can help the bladder problems. These are uh, you know, things that uh, prevent you from having to uh, void so often. And the standard old-fashioned constipation remedies should be used when necessary. Now, levodopa. Um, there has not been a controlled trial of levodopa in PSP, at least not, a, not one that's large enough to really uh, draw any conclusions. But basically, 42% from this one study, that sounds about right in my experience, that for about 42% of people with PSP would benefit somewhat from levodopa carbidopa, mostly for only a year or two. It's mainly the rigidity and the gait that improve, but the eye movement problem and the speech and the swallowing generally do not improve much. This is some uh, data from review of my own patient's charts. It was published a long time ago, 1993. Dopamine agonists, these are drugs like Mirapex, Requip, Pramipexol is Mirapex. These are two older ones that aren't used anymore. They can help a little bit, but really no better than levodopa. There's no evidence that a patient who does not respond to levodopa would respond to these drugs. So I don't use these in PSP. Amantadine, when, um, when this uh, pharmacist and I did this uh, paper back in 93, we reviewed the response of all patients with PSP to a whole bunch of drugs that had been given in the, on the theory that they had Parkinson's disease. And amantadine was one of them. And it turned out that amantadine was the best drug besides levodopa in helping the PSP, maybe even better than levodopa. And that was the first time that anybody had, had noticed this. So now amantadine is really, along with levodopa, the drug of choice for symptoms of PSP. Amitriptyline is an old time, um, Antidepressant, it's still used, still works. It's been around since the 1950s. There has been a small double-blind study back in 1985, very small study, four patients.
but um, the, uh, the problem is that some patients with amitriptyline develop uh, worsening of their balance, worsening of their postural instability. And that can be such a big problem, even though it's only a few people, that I have stopped using amitriptyline in PSP. And those are my own findings from reviewing my own charts. We don't need to spend time on that. Now, these SSRIs and SNRIs are the newer antidepressants. Uh, there's been no controlled trials in PSP with them either. It's only anecdotal, in other words, a few patients here, a few patients there in the literature. But they are commonly used for depression in PSP and CBD. They're also used for the pseudobulbar affect and other disinhibited behavior. Pseudobulbar affect means inappropriate, uncontrolled laughing or crying. Uh, no published data, but we use it and sometimes it works. Hard to tell whether it works better than placebo would. This rocket sign, kind of an unkind name for it, is when somebody with PSP, because of their disinhibition, they just stand up out of their chair and try to walk, even though they know that their balance is not up to the task. And they end up falling. So this is a dangerous thing. And maybe giving one of these antidepressants can inhibit that behavior a little bit. It's certainly worth trying. Now, the cholinesterase inhibitors, these are the Alzheimer drugs that can help the memory problems and other aspects of dementia of Alzheimer's. There's been very little experience in using those in PSP, but it's reasonable to start them. Uh, the memantine, which is Namenda, that one I have found just is not well tolerated by people with PSP, so I've stopped using it. And it's been found in a study not to help the dementia anyway. The benzodiazepines, which are drugs like Valium and Ativan, Xanax, um, they're useful mainly in people with corticobasal degeneration, uh, in which there is a lot of muscle rigidity and dystonia. It can be painful even in corticobasal. And in some people with PSP, you can have that. Uh, it's not as bad as in corticobasal. And it's worth trying one of these as a muscle relaxant. Side effects are weakness and sedation. These drugs are also sometimes useful for the sleep problem in PSP, which is very common. Uh, you'll hear more about the uh, physical aspects of PSP later, but just be alert to the rocket sign. Passive range of motion exercises, which are what we all did a few minutes ago. And formal physical therapy can be very valuable in teaching the person how to walk, how to get into the habit of actually using the walking aid rather than just launching off in an uninhibited way. Now, the dysphagia problem, the swallowing, uh, should be evaluated in a formal way with a modified barium swallow at the first signs of dysphagia. And um, eventually, the question of a gastrostomy tube, a feeding tube. This stands for percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, PEG. That, the question of that will arise, but really it's a small minority of people with PSP who end up deciding they want to have this. The main reasons to have it are either marked weight loss or very long time to get a meal into you so that it disrupts the family's uh, activities. First episode of aspiration pneumonia, might be a reason to do the PEG, or a small amount of aspiration with each meal might be another reason to do the PEG. But as I say, most patients with PSP and their families uh, decide against a PEG. And doctors are well advised to be realistic and frank about the issues of quality versus quantity of life when discussing whether to have the feeding tube. Now, the eye movement problem this can be very difficult to treat. Uh, this is always very difficult to treat. Uh, the low blink rate of PSP can allow the eyes to dry out. It's called reactive conjunctivitis. The eyes can become red. And so the treatment for that is simply to very frequently use lubricant eye drops. Just keep it right there in your pocket. And as soon as you start to feel dry, just squirt a few drops in. It doesn't have any side effects. 
At night, you can put in this Vaseline type stuff, which will last the whole night. Problem is, if you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, the vision's kind of blurry. Not good. Blepharospasm is the uncontrolled blinking of the eyes that a lot of people with PSP have. This responds very nicely to Botox injections into the little muscles around the eyelids. And it can last up to 50 weeks as opposed to uh, two or three months, Botox in other areas. Now, other focal dystonias. Uh, focal dystonia means a part of the body that maintains a certain abnormal posture, typically with a twisting component. So for example, torticollis, where the head is constantly looking over to one side, happens in some people with PSP, but more common in CBD. This may respond to Botox, but when injecting the neck muscles in somebody with PSP or CBD, the doctor has to be really careful not to let the Botox leak over into the swallowing muscles, which are already not working so well, because uh, that could permit the person to start aspirating where they weren't aspirating before. Aspirating means getting food or drink down the wrong pipe. The limb dystonia of corticobasal uh, may respond to Botox. Uh, pain relief is the main issue there. Um, and a referral to a pain management specialist may be very useful. They can do various uh, injections with um, anesthetics. And it's very useful for the doctor to get some kind of rehab specialist involved early in the course if a person, if the patient has focal dystonia. As I say, it's only a minority of people with PSP, but it's a majority of people with corticobasal who have that problem. Now, how do you treat the swallowing problems? Once you've got that uh, modified barium swallow, a nice evaluation by a speech and swallowing uh, professional, um, thickening the thin liquids, because it's the thin liquids that are the most problem. Avoid tough, these things are, some of these things are pretty, uh, uh, pretty obvious, but they're not all applicable to every patient, avoiding tough, dry, or leafy foods, flex the neck forward while swallowing, which lines up the mouth with the esophagus better rather than lining it up with the trachea, which is what you do if the neck is backwards. And unfortunately, in PSP, a lot of people have their necks backwards like this. Taking small bites, chew thoroughly, and monitor the size of the fork loads. In PSP, a lot of people have this disinhibition. They overload the fork, they overload the mouth, and they have trouble swallowing as a result of the disease, and the result is choking. So the caregiver has to make sure that the person with PSP does not take excessively large fork loads. The speech therapy, in my experience, is rarely helpful. It's just so difficult for people with PSP to learn new speech techniques, but it's still worth a try. Uh, amplifying devices may be useful, hand signs may be useful, and um, pointing boards, electronic typing devices in selected cases where the patient can direct not only their gaze, because the eye movement is a problem, but also their attention, to pay attention to the task for long enough to get a message across. Now let's move on to experimental treatment. I'm going to discuss these five things in greater or lesser amount of detail. Coenzyme Q10, I'm sure you've heard of this. This is a treatment for the mitochondria. Coenzyme Q10 is a, a normal chemical that's in all of our bodies that the mitochondria use to help them make energy. And it turns out that um, a high dose of coenzyme Q10 does help the symptoms of PSP, at least in the short term. This was a study in Germany, 21 patients with PSP. 10 of them were on CoQ10, 10 of them were on placebo, so it was a blinded study. In fact, it was a double blind study. Neither the doctors nor the patients knew who was on which. Now they use this proprietary form of CoQ10 that's not available in the United States, so it's a little hard to compare 
to extend the results to the form that we have available. They use this nano dispersion form because they thought that the little tiny particles of CoQ10 would get into the mitochondria better than the particles that you can get here. Don't know if that's true. They use this fancy um, radiology technique, this imaging technique for looking at the energy production in the brain, in the brain cells. This is very cool. I mean, it's not that fancy. We could do it right here in our hospital too. Uh, this is called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Magnetic resonance spectroscopy. It's done on an MRI machine, but instead of imaging, it produces this uh, readout of what chemicals are present in the little square of tissue that the radiologist indicates with the mouse. And it showed, it showed that th this is the MRS results. It showed that after six weeks, uh, people on the um, coenzyme Q10 got a little bit better in terms of their energy production, and people on placebo, as expected, got a little bit worse. Same with this other measure of energy production. This ATP is the molecule that carries our energy around in our blood. And when they looked at the actual patient, they used the PSP rating scale, and they found that the people on Cohen, now that the, it's backwards, where downward is better. The people with coenzyme Q10 got a little bit better. This is one point on a 100-point scale. Typically, the patients had a score of about 30 when they started, so they improved by a little over one point on average, and the, the placebo patients got a little bit worse, as expected, over a period of six weeks. And they also tested them with this mental test called the frontal assessment battery. They looked at the frontal lobe functioning. And here, better goes up. So the people on the coenzyme Q10 got a little better. The people on placebo got a little worse. So now there's a, two trials going on of looking to see whether CoQ10 actually slows the progression of the disease as opposed to just helping the symptoms in an immediate fashion. There's, uh, I don't know, maybe half a dozen centers around the United States that are doing that trial, and it's still open for um, volunteers. There are, none in the, um, there are none in New Jersey that are participating. If you're interested in this, um, go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials I assume you all know about this website that the NIH has, clinicaltrials.gov and you can see what, and then you enter PSP into the search box, and it'll show you all trials of PSP uh, in the United States and Europe that are um, looking for patients or have completed enrollment. Okay, now surgical approaches. I'll get back to a couple of medical approaches in a minute. Deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation, which is a routine thing in Parkinson's disease. Every major academic medical center and a lot of non-academic medical centers are doing this in Parkinson's. It doesn't work in PSP, in the parts of the brain where it works in Parkinson's. Pallidotomy is, doesn't use stimulation. It's just a, a little destruction of a part of the brain using microwaves. Helps Parkinson's very nicely. It doesn't do anything for PSP. But there is an investigational deep brain stimulation of a different part of the brain called the PPN, the pontine nucleus. And here's a picture of that. It's a little hard to see up here. Uh, but this shows these two electrodes. One of them is going into the uh, subthalamic nucleus, where typically it's stimulated in Parkinson's. And the other one's going into the pontine nucleus, which is pretty close, for PSP. Uh, so there's a trial going on right now, supported by our organization, Cure PSP, to see if this really works in PSP. And this is a description of that trial. It's in Toronto. Now another, you could call it surgical, uh, 
type of treatment uses transcranial magnetic stimulation. This, so nothing physical actually has to penetrate the body. It just passes a magnetic wave through the scalp, the skull. You don't have to shave your hair or anything. This is being tested at UCLA right now, also under a grant from Cure PSP. And the uh, preliminary data shows um, uh, it's, it's, still, it's still not really accessible. They, they have to do more patients before they can draw any conclusions. But they're hoping, they're mainly hoping to improve the behavioral part of PSP, but they're also stimulating an area that might help the movement part. Just as long as they're doing it, they, they figured they'd try this also and maybe they'll get lucky. Now, two drugs that are uh, being tested for their prophylactic possibilities, their ability maybe to slow the progression of the disease. In other words, slow down the rate at which the brain cells are lost. No other treatment we have is even suspected of doing this, except maybe the coenzyme Q10. This trial of this drug called Tideglucib is the generic name. The brand name would be Zentalor, not a big improvement. The name of the drug company is Nocera. It's in Spain. They have completed the enrollment of this study. We're one of the enrolling sites here at Robert Wood. But uh, the patients are still being treated. It's a one-year treatment period. And it'll be over in the fall. And uh, hopefully within a few months after that, we'll have the data analyzed and uh, have the answer. This drug affects tau. It affects the attachment of phosphate groups to tau, if you want the biochemical details. There's an abnormality of that in PSP. There's too much phosphate hanging onto the tau. We don't know if that's cause or effect, but in any case, this drug reduces that, and hopefully it'll reduce the aggregation of tau into those tangles. Now, the divunatide is the other drug that's presently being tested as long-term protection for PSP. This drug is a, um, whoops, is a fragment of a large protein. This, this is a readout of the amino acids in, a, in one protein. Each of these dots here is an actually a, an abbreviation that you can't make out for an amino acid. And a very smart researcher in Israel found that if you just chop out, uh, now, first of all, you can't, th this protein is called activity-dependent neuroprotection protein. It helps maintain those neurofibrillary, sorry, it helps maintain the microtubules. Remember one of the first slides I showed you showed those microtubules with the tau acting as the scaffolding and the microtubules were breaking up in PSP? Well, this protein prevents that from happening under certain circumstances. But the problem is you can't give a protein into the brain unless you inject it directly into the brain because it'll get, the protein would get broken up in the stomach and if you inject it into a vein, it's not gonna cross the blood-brain barrier anyway, it's such a large molecule. But this researcher in Israel figured out that if you chop out this one little section of it, which is only eight amino acids long, that's small enough that it will get into the brain if it's administered as a nasal spray and it has most of the, of the microtubule protecting properties of the whole protein. That was an amazing discovery. And as I learned very recently, she named it divunatide after the Jewish practice of davening when you pray. That's a rhythmic swaying that Orthodox Jews do when they pray, davening. And the tide refers to peptide which is, means a fragment of a protein. So it's a combination of Yiddish and Latin in this uh, drug name. Pretty cool. Um, this shows the effect of divunatide in mice. It helps them, uh, mice that have been unkindly given a PSP gene and uh, their brain is not working right they have a lesser ability to learn this maze. 
And if you give them divunatide at an early age, the gene won't have that much of an effect. You see, they'll be just as good as the normal mice in running the maze. So the, um, the, study, the, the rationale for studying this drug is that it reduces the tau pathology in PSP in, um, in animals. And clinically, it's been tested in uh, healthy people. It does get into the brain. It's well tolerated. Uh, it's been tested in people with minimal cognitive impairment, which is people with very early signs of dementia that can turn into Alzheimer's in later years. It improved their memory just a touch. And in people with schizophrenia, it improved their ability to conduct daily tasks in people with schizophrenia who had cognitive impairment. Of course, we don't know exactly what was going on with the microtubules or the tau in those people, uh, but just based on clinical assessment at, at the bedside. So that was enough to justify a trial in people with PSP. And the FDA has said that if this is successful for PSP, they've said this both for the Devunatide study and for the Tadeglisib study, which is the one from Spain. The FDA has said that if either of those studies turns up a good result, that they will approve the, the drug. They won't insist on a second larger study like they would for a normal, nor, uh, normally for a drug. And that's because PSP is an orphan disease. It's a rare disease, so it's very difficult for anybody to get together enough money, enough motivation to study it. And also because there isn't anything on the market already for PSP. So what, even if this just has a small effect, it would still be a major step forward. And the FDA, even though they're an agency of the federal government, they're smart enough to recognize that. So um, this is the, just the design of the Devonatide study. Uh, we're still recruiting for this, by the way. Uh, we'll probably finish the recruitment in October. There are 300 patients overall. We're trying to get up to about uh, 10 patients here at Robert Wood. And um, if you're interested, you can contact me. Uh, the side effects of Devunatide, little nasal passage irritation, sometimes headache, dizziness, nausea, excessive sweating, nothing serious. Uh, I won't go through the patient qualifications. Basically, you have to be able to take five steps with a walker or minor assistance. You cannot be wheelchair bound. And you have to have a reliable caregiver who can help you with all the requirements of the study. This just shows the uh, assessments that will be done. A lumbar puncture is optional. And for more information about the study, you can go to clinicaltrial.gov or clinicaltrials.gov. Either one works, actually. Or you can call my nurse. Here's her number. And that is enough for today. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break uh, before our next speaker, which means um, if you'd all be back in your seats by 11.50. Okay? Thank you.